Dr. Vickers graduated from the University of Toronto, the National College of Naturopathic Medicine, and the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine. While she treats all illnesses for the past 25 plus years, her practice is focused on women's health, immune disorders, cancer, and chronic diseases. Dr. Vickers uses acupuncture, Chinese herbs, hydrotherapy, injection therapy, diet, and nutritional supplements to assist her patients in achieving better health and balance. Very good. So I'm going to talk about lupus and um, just some simple things that you can do. We hear that with the medicines there are a lot of side effects. So things that you can do to counteract the side effects that are safe, um, accessible, and hopefully um, effective. So I'm going to basically talk about five different things. I'm going to start with exercise because we all know all of us need to exercise. So what we've learned with the studies is that if we look at the studies, we all need to exercise. It's good for our bones, it's good for our heart, it's good for our mind, sense of well-being, it decreases stress, it decreases inflammation. It's good for all of us. But when you have a chronic disease such as lupus, which has a great inflammatory component and is hard on your heart, hard on your kidneys, Exercise becomes that piece that actually is a treatment. Not only is it good for you, but it's part of the treatment that you should do. And the should is the piece. How do I do it when I'm feeling so fatigued or I have such joint pain I can hardly get out of bed? I haven't had enough sleep. And what we're understanding now looking at the studies is that with exercise you can actually break it down. So can you set your timer on your kitchen clock and walk around your kitchen or around your house if, or around your apartment for five minutes before you sit down. When you get up to go to the bathroom, can you take an extra loop before you sit back down? So every little bit above baseline actually aids, helps. Well, the goal is 30 minutes a day. So if you break that 30 minutes a day into five, six minute segments, does that seem more accessible? Can you have bands when you're sitting and use bands in your chair that you do for five minutes at a time for six times a day. All of those things actually add up over baseline. Studies show that if you add even doing range of motion exercises, if you're in bed, doing range of motion exercises in bed for 30 minutes, not all at once, broken up, can actually make a difference. So when they look at lupus and they look at exercise, the studies say that while people are in, they usually do them for three month periods of time. It's usually two to three times a week for 30 minutes. You usually have a personal trainer. While people have that personal trainer and they're doing it, they're 30 minutes, two to three times a week, people are able to do that. But as soon as the personal trainer goes away, compliance goes down and people aren't able to sustain it because they don't have someone there saying, how are you doing, keep going, yes, you can do this. In their, it's harder for us to do that in our own head than it is to have someone cheerleading us on. So it's like, how can we do that for ourselves? So some of the things that I talk to my patients about is get YouTube. If you have access to a computer, you can put up little YouTube videos. There are many YouTube videos, five minute little segments that do bands, that do, you know, walking, that can encourage you to just walk. Moderate walking is great. So anything that you can do above baseline is beneficial. So I always talk about if you're not doing any exercise at all, start with five minutes a day. You're worth five minutes a day. We're all worth five minutes a day. And do that for a week. And if you can do it for a week, then the next week try ten minutes a day. And if you can do that, then the next week add five more minutes until you get up to um, 30 minutes a day. Now we've heard about the steroids and what steroids does to weight. We all know that when you're on a dose of steroids, you gain weight. One of the things that we can do with that, there's some studies that show that after eating, 30 minutes after eating, if you move for 10 minutes, that that actually increases your metabolism a little bit. So there's some balance with that. You're going to gain weight on steroids. That's, I mean, that's just the side effect. But we might be able to modulate that a little bit with a little movement. And I'm not talking about signing up for the marathon. I'm just talking about moderate walking around your house. 
You don't need to be in a gym. If you can get outside, that's great. You know, you can do it when the sun isn't at its peak. So you can do it in the morning, you can do it later at night. But 30, minute, 30 minutes, so 10 minutes after each meal, moving, helps to increase your metabolism. So that's a goal to think about. So this is a study, this is actually um, a comparison, a retrospective study, looking at seven different studies with lupus. And how does exercise affect fatigue? And all of the studies across the board, whether they were for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two to three times a day, showed that if you could do that for at least 30 days and 90 days, your energy increased. So we all want to try and move. Just do it is, the, is basically the idea with movement. Vitamin D. So in Portland, Oregon, the average serum level of vitamin D is 15 nanograms per DL. That's insufficient. It's deficient. Normal is 30. Optimal is probably, there's much controversy on this, but optimal is somewhere probably around 40 to 50. So pretty much everyone in Portland, Oregon needs vitamin D. So as I was saying, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, that's the blood test, that's the best indicator, and we want that to at least be 30. We really would like it to be 40. Most of the studies show that at about 40, joint pain goes down, arthralgias go down, fatigue levels actually go down. There were a few studies on African-American women and vitamin D, and they found that women, that African-American women actually have lower vitamin D than do Caucasian women. Both are deficient, but African-American women tend to have less vitamin D than do um, Caucasian women. Fish oil. We've heard a lot about fish oil. We've heard that it's good for our heart. We've heard that it's good for our brain. We've heard that we should just eat fish. But then we hear there's mercury in the fish and that there are pesticides in the fish and we shouldn't eat fish because there's too much contamination in the fish. So what do we do? It's a good question. So the two things that we're looking for in fish oil are the omega-3 fatty acids, eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA. So that's the main one that's used for decreasing inflammation in our body and docehexanoic acid, DHA, and that's the main one we think about in terms of nerves, right, in terms of the brain. So we know that um, there are omega-6 fatty acids. We hear, well, just take flax seeds, just, t you know, um, do flax oil, do evening primrose oil, because those omega-6 fatty acids also contain omega-3 fatty acids, the alpha-linoleic acid, and our body will just convert those to the EPA and to the DHA. But studies have shown that we're not, as humans, we're actually not very good converters of the omega-6, omega-3 into DHA and EPA. So I would say that we need to actually take fish oil or we need to eat the fish. So what they say is a portion, two to three servings of fish a week, and usually it's a cooked three, um, three ounce serving of fish. And I, next slide has the, how much per, whether it's cod, mackerel, tuna, salmon, caviar is the most, contains about 1.25 grams of EPA plus DHA a day. So usually we're looking for 1.5 grams of fish oil, EPA, DHA a day. So, you know, it's doable with a fatty fish. So we can see that caviar in a three ounce serving has five grams, right, of EPA and DHA. Most of us are eating salmon. That's at the 1.5. So salmon actually is pretty plentiful here in the Northwest. It's easy to get. Costco has it all the time, you know, and, and a serving of salmon three times a week gives you one and a half grams of fish oil a day. So if you can eat, you know, salmon, that's great. So you can look, there are many different things. So if you don't have access to fish or you don't like fish or you're sensitive to fish, then think about having, taking a fish oil supplement. And there are many. So there's been some controversy lately where there was a study that came out from England and it looked at over-the-counter fish oil supplements and they said 
is actually what's in the fish oil, what the <laughs> label claims is in the fish oil, what's in the fish oil. Turned out that about 50% it was not true. So if you're going to do over-the-counter fish oil, you want to do a good brand. So you might want to talk to your doctor about what is a good brand. And what I would say about a good brand, I have no affiliation, is that one that's independently tested. So there are many in the Northwest that are independently tested. So what it says on the label has gone to an outside <coughs> lab and have been independently tested that, yes, actually what it says on the label is true. So, thing, so places that you can get over the counter here, that would be Nordic Naturals, Carlson's, Eskimo 3. There are many um, <coughs> brands here that are readily available. I think it's preferable to eat. I always think it's better to eat your nutrition rather than take it as a supplement. And we all know that most of you take a lot of supplements and it's hard. How do you take all those supplements? How do you make that medicine your food? Hard enough to take what you need to take, let alone adding something else in. But I do think that fish oil is important. Here's a study looking at fish oils and decreasing cardiovascular disease in patients with lupus. So we know that cardiovascular disease is prevalent in patients with lupus. And so in this study, they were looking at um, if you take fish oil and they use different markers to see what, how do we decrease inflammation and how do we decrease um, insulin sensitivity, in, insensitivity. And what they found was by taking 1,500 milligrams of EPA plus DHA a day, a day actually decreased inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein, nitric oxide. So fish oil, I think it's good as a general. It usually is not contraindicated. Always check with your doctor first. I tried to pick things that were pretty unanimous and not contraindicated with any of the meds that you're on. Fish oil does thin the blood a little bit when you get up into the high doses, so if you're on a blood thinner, you need to talk to your doctor about that. Acupuncture, okay. Another thing that's interesting, acupuncture. So I've been an acupuncturist for 28 years now, and um, I think it's fabulous for pain. A lot of people, I, I see people before they're diagnosed with lupus. They come in because they think they have fibromyalgia, or they think they have chronic sore throats mouse sores, they have a rash, it's not quite a malar rash, but it comes and goes. They have a lot of fatigue, they're not sleeping. Um, they have digestive problems. They have, they have a tendency to get pneumonia or tendency to get pleurisy. They have chest pain. And so one of the things that, well, we're trying to do blood tests and do a workup, one of the things that can help alleviate symptoms, acupuncture isn't a cure, but it's a great modality to help to alleviate symptoms and provide some relief. It is a needle. The needles are very thin. They're paper, they're hair thin. I brought some with me if anyone's interested to see what they look like. It's not, I think when you have a chronic illness, you've had a lot of blood draws and you've had a lot of exposures to needles. And so when I say it's the application of needles in many different places in your body, people think, I don't want another needle. But I, th I would try to think of it as a fine hair inserted just very minutely into the skin to stimulate and cause an anti-inflammatory relaxation effect. So it's, acupuncture's been around for a long time, 4,000 years. We're very lucky in Portland, Oregon. There's actually two colleges of acupuncture medicine, Chinese medicine here in Portland, Oregon. There's the Oriental College of um, Oriental Medicine here, it's actually right next door, right there, right a few blocks down there, and that's um, been around since um, 83. I was in their first graduating class. And then NCNM, where I teach now, which is the um, National College of Natural Medicine, they have a program, a, a classical Chinese medical program that's been around for 12 years, I believe, and I teach there now. So you have two programs, which is great, so there are a lot of acupuncturists around, and there are a lot of um, clinics that offer low-cost treatment. So there's a lot of accessibility. It's recognized by the FDA. 
It's, um, there really are no side effects. You might get a bruise from where the needle's inserted, but really there are no side effects. Most people benefit by having increased energy, better sleep, better digestion, less pain, um, less inflammation. So I think it's worth um, looking at and at least trying. So there's a clinic um, called the IEP clinic, the Immune Enhancement Project, which um, was started 22 years ago, 23 years ago, and it's a nonprofit clinic that offers um, acupuncture and Chinese medicine for chronic disease. And they've been looking at lupus over the last 10 years or so, and they've started just in the last six months, they've started offering treatment for people with lupus. So it's a great idea. There's a handout over on the table by Molly's picture over on that table there by Sabuti Dharmananda that talks about what the program is. And it's a very low cost free, if you qualify for free, to go and try Chinese medicine if you choose to do that. So I know that both schools have clinics where they offer low cost clinics. So it's really accessible in Portland, Oregon. So I think I talked mostly about what is acupuncture. So this is one of my patients who I was treating was undergoing chemotherapy and I was treating acupuncture for um, side effects of chemotherapy, mainly nausea in her ear. So um, the needles, you place the needles, as you can see, there's five little needles in her ear and um, they're left in for 15 to 20 minutes. Each of the needles are disposable and sterile. They're left in, yes, as I said, um, for 15 to 20 minutes and then taken out and discarded. And patients generally feel relaxed. A lot of people fall asleep on the table. So, I mean, it seems odd that you would have needles in your body and fall asleep, but that really is the common reaction. Food that I often recommend, cherry juice, cherries. So, what's great about cherry juice and cherries? Cherries actually decrease C-reactive protein and nitric oxide in the body. They're a great anti-inflammatory. So, just adding a little bit of cherry juice or eating 50 cherries, which, of course, then you might get cherry belly, but in the Northwest, we have lots of, you know, great cherries, um, is really great for helping to lower inflammation. It's really great for pain, you know, joint pain. So, it's something that's accessible, easy to try, doesn't interfere with any of your meds. This, I brought up this little study because some people say, well, I can't do any juice because juice is too high, you know, it's too glycemic and make my blood sugar go up and I'm, I'm worried about that. But cherry juice actually tends to be a low glycemic fruit, which is great. So in this study, it's a small study. Most of the studies done on food are small. I'll give it that. But they saw no change in blood sugar or insulin levels. So cherry juice really is a low glycemic fruit. So what, how much cherry juice do you need to do? So as I said, it's 50 cherries. It's um, equivalent to two tablespoons of the concentrate. Most of the studies are done on 80 to 100 cherries or on 50 cherries. So it's one to two tablespoons. So you can di take concentrate, which is available, Freddy's, all the, you know, Trader Joe's, and dilute it into an eight ounce glass and drink your cherry juice while you take your pills. So you're getting a little anti-inflammatory while you're taking your pills. So just to recap, five ways, exercise, exercise, exercise for all of us. We all need to exercise. Vitamin D, consider taking some vitamin D. Talk to your doctor about that, vitamin D. Fish oil, think about including fish in your diet or incorporating um, some over-the-counter fish oil, cherry juice. Think about eating some cherries. We're just going to come into cherry season. It's supposed to be early this year. Um, and acupuncture. Consider trying some acupuncture. Thank you.